Welcome to the War Academy channel. All of us have seen movies or documentaries about Stalingrad, in which children interact with both the German and Soviet troops, in their fight for the city. But, do we know the story behind these children? Do we know what they really did in Stalingrad? Why did many of them help the Germans if they were Soviets? And finally, how many of them survived the battle that lasted almost 200 days? Next, in this program, we are going to explain all these issues so that we understand what his situation was in his harsh role within this enormous battle. But first, let's briefly put ourselves in context. To do this, we must go until June 28, 1942, when the Germans launched their so-called Operation Blue, this being the second major offensive launched against the Soviet Union. Although at first the objective of this offensive did not include taking the city of Stalingrad, by mid-July the objectives of the operation changed. The main modification of this plan, was the division of the German forces so that they could take their different objectives simultaneously. This caused for practical purposes, that the different German armies, had less power and ability to achieve their goals. In any case, these troops gradually made their way, and specifically, Paulus's forces reached the outskirts of Stalingrad by the end of August, beginning the battle for the city. These fighting begin with heavy German bombardment of the city, where the Soviets had established strong defenses. It should be noted that by this time, Stalin's order of, not one step back, was more in force than ever, and Stalingrad represented a position that was forbidden for any soldier to leave. At first, very few of the city's 600,000 civilians were evacuated, and the vast majority of them remained trapped in Stalingrad. With this measure, the Soviet commanders hoped that the resistance of the soldiers would be much stronger, as they found themselves defending not only buildings, but also their inhabitants. However, little by little, these civilians began to be evacuated on the large barges that came, and went along the banks of the Volga. It is estimated that in total, of those 600,000 inhabitants, some 250,000 were evacuated. This leaves a figure of more than 300,000 people, who never left the city. While many of them were killed in the initial shelling and fighting, there was a group of approximately 50,000 civilians who were trapped with no chance of escape. And it is precisely in this group that the famous children of Stalingrad that we are going to see today, are found. The day-to-day -day life of these civilians who were left behind in Stalingrad, and who did not die in the initial bombardments was to go from one place to another, seeking refuge, as the Germans advanced. These people were concentrated in the cellars that had not yet collapsed, in the sewers of the city, and in caves that began to be excavated on the banks of the Volga. Once they had a more or less secure shelter, to protect themselves from the bombardment and fighting, the second concern was to find food and water. While the Soviets initially had tremendous trouble feeding their soldiers, we can imagine the difficult access these civilians had to food. Later, when winter came and they were trapped in the city, this time with the Germans, the situation continued the same or worse. In any case, and during these first weeks of September and October, the civilians were leaving their shelters every time they noticed a break in the fighting to look for food. Usually the best they could find was a dead horse from an explosion. When they located one, they had to hurry to get as much of it as they could, as they competed with the soldiers, as well as with the stray dogs and the rats themselves. Although the majority of these civilians were women and children, since the men had been mobilized and militias, those in charge of carrying out these tasks of searching for food and other objectives were usually children. The reason is that they were more agile, smaller and represented a lesser target when they were shot. This allowed them to move more easily than an adult and sneak into more remote places. In addition to these daytime breaks, these children made their outings at night. One of his main targets during the first weeks of fighting was, a grain silo that the Germans had captured. Many managed to sneak inside and fill their containers with all the wheat they could and then run away. The Germans for their part, who also used this wheat for themselves, gave orders to the sentinels to shoot at any intruder who tried to steal this cereal. 
the rations of the German soldiers themselves were also a very appetizing target for these children, but the consequences were again the possibility of being shot. It didn't take long for both the Germans and these children to see that they could, in quotes associate, to achieve the objective that each of them had, avoiding the greatest possible danger. Little by little, some German soldiers begin to assign tasks to these children in exchange for bread, or any other food. These functions range from repairing or cleaning part of their equipment and uniform, to information about the enemy or the search for water, the latter being the case that occurred the most during this battle. The Germans, who were short of water, gave their bottles and canteens to these children to be filled in the Volga River and brought back. Due to the numerous snipers that the Soviets had in the city, the German soldiers tried not to go out into the open more than necessary, and that is why they sent these children. At first, Soviet soldiers were unaware of these deals and let civilians wander without paying much attention to them. Everything changed when the high command of the Red Army realized what was happening and gave the order to shoot down anyone who collaborated minimally with the Germans. The objective of these children, along with the rest of the civilian population that was trapped in the city, was not to fight for one side or another, but simply to survive. Even so, there were many who, out of simple convenience, decided to go over to the Germans, and others who acted as double agents. Of course, these children not only collaborated with the Germans, they also performed functions within the Red Army such as career, water search, and in general, actions very similar to those they performed for the Germans. Again, their goal was still to give them some food both for themselves, and for a family member that they could have left inside the city. This situation, would become much more critical for the civilian population when on November 19th, the Soviets launched Operation Uranus. This ended up surrounding them in the city along with the Germans, and soon the intense cold and hunger began to wreak havoc on both. Finally, when the encircled German troops at Stalingrad surrendered, the Soviets found 10,000 civilians still alive inside the city. Of those 10,000, 1,000 of them were children. This number is tremendously catastrophic, considering that just a few months before the city had more than half a million inhabitants. However, it is just as striking that 10,000 civilians could have endured all the ravages of war, hunger and cold in recent months, during the 200 days that the fighting lasted. This battle officially ended on February 2nd, when the German troops surrendered inside the city. By that time, however, the front was already many miles to the west, and fierce fighting was taking place just a few miles from the city of Kharkov. Well, that's it for today's program, which I hope has helped you learn about a little explained facet of this Battle of Stalingrad. I invite you to watch the live show we had with Carlos Caballero Yorado in which we carefully explained all the details of this operation. And well, this video ends here, thank you all very much, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you in the next one, see you soon.